Oh, yeah. So yeah. anything yeah. you do, you get a camera. Yeah. I'll be facilitating the feedback. Oh, you are. I'm not. No. Oh. oh, no, no, no. It's for the sport. Don't worry. I'll, I'll handle it. Okay, everyone. We're going to take feedback of the breakouts we had before the uh, before the webinar session. Um, so, so the first group, the community learning hubs, the community learning hubs, and that would be. Now, in oh, I'll give the chance. Shall, shall we start with group two, the um, ROI group, spokesperson for group two? Would that be yes? That would be Clive. Oh, so our uh, delegation, eh? <laughs> I just have to find the. I have to find it first. I'll get them up on screen. So there was group two. Should we be recording this? Okay. Right. So yeah, this was a um, this was a pretty rip snorting discussion. I thought. I don't know the rest of you, but uh, it's good. Um, so uh, let's see. We we I, I mostly wrote notes down at the bottom that I hadn't quite worked out how to put them into the other. If you go down to the very bottom, there was a set of notes here, um, and this was uh, credited in as much as I could do so to the uh, people who actually made the suggestions, but. Um, it was, part of it was, uh, part of the ROI um, discussion involved um, bringing into perspective the, the relative um, costs of, of being a member of the OERU and that the, the actual cash costs were, were seen as pretty trivial. Um, however, the uh, allocating the, or the looking at the cost of people's participation in the inst institutions participating on behalf of the OERU was, was somewhat less um, and significant. However, um, uh, I think Phil mentioned um, to mitigate that, that he also saw that staff t time participation as being a, um, the, organ the, the institutions work towards open, further openness rather than, a, than something specifically kind of um, serving the OERU, if that makes sense. So it wasn't, it wasn't a, a lost value um, just because it was in aid of the OERU partnership. Um, uh, another interesting idea was the way that we account for our costs and therefore account for our savings as a result of the membership in the OERU depends on how we account for those costs. So for example, Rory was saying that at Athabasca, they, uh, they actually include the cost of learning materials in their tuition. So they're actually saving quite a lot of money by using OERs, um, which is inspired in part by the partnership. Um, so just how we choose to uh, account for these things makes all the difference. Um, there's also the idea that, that um, we could uh, question equally well, you know, if we look at OER membership as potentially a way of gaining exposure and name recognition for our institutions above other institutions, that um, we could think about OERU as having some of the same nebulous benefit that you can sometimes associate with marketing. I think uh, uh, Andy suggest, you know, pointed out that 50% um, of marketing budgets are wasted, but you just never know which 50. Um, and uh, so that you could also justify the uh, investment in OERU membership based on, on potentially a marketing uh, expense. Um, and everyone, I think, agreed that one of the OERU's biggest problems is that um, compared to the commercial MOOCs that have venture capital backing and so on and, and huge marketing budgets, name recognition of the OERU is very low. And what we're, we wanted to try to identify what the differentiating factors were for the OERU relative to the, what, what from a learner's perspective would be equivalent offerings because they may not appreciate the open nature of OERU relative to the so-called free nature of um, Coursera or edX or one of the other plat MOOC platforms. And so what would cause uh, a learner to actually um, 
pick OERU over those others, would they actually be compelled by the value statements and would they even be aware of the value statements that the OERU has relative to the other uh, apparent competitors? And so we realized that essentially increasing the name recognition of the OERU and it projecting its values um, was our crucial, was a crucial step towards achieving greater return on investment for being a member of the network. Um, Let's see. I'm not sure I can interpret all of these things. Well, we also looked at the a couple of tensions that are um, inherent in the participation in the in the network, namely that organiz uh, institutions have a need to justify expenditure on all of these um, greater good or public good uh, type um, investments. Um, they need to see some measure of return uh, to, ju to justify those and that um, you know, we, we, we say that you know, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a value in being a member with even if you can't, can't show a monetary or financial um, return that there's a goodwill return and various other forms of return um, and that we need to somehow work out how to include those in a return on investment um, justification. Um, we had the kind of the realization that um, one of the possible differentiating factors that adds value to the OERU is the fact that we're actually implicitly defining an open standard for qualifications by virtue of multiple institutions agreeing to honor um, assessment or uh, honor materials for assessment and, and have common qualifications. That gives us an advantage over the entirely proprietary um, qualifications that are offered by some of these competing MOOCs like edX and Coursera and the Harvards and Stanfords of the world that are offering their brand of proprietary qualification. And so by virtue of being part of this network, you actually are buying into a, an open standard, which could give um, comfort to people who are trying to achieve, uh, you know, taking part in our courses as opposed to in those proprietary ones. Um, Let's see. So yes, yeah, so the idea that ROI has to be Don. Don was very um, made the good point that yeah we we have to be sure that we're um, encompassing all sorts of different kinds of value when we talk about ROI rather than just just what can be accounted for in the in the ledger. Um, and one of the yeah one of the potential weaknesses of the OERU model was that in in our strength of um, commitment to protecting learner privacy, we're missing out on one of the big um, motivations for people taking part, or institutions taking part in online MOOCs, which was uh, the ability to, to gain lead generation information from the MOOC providers by virtue of them effectively selling contacts. Um, and so uh, that the question then came, what, would it be better for the OARU to change its values and, and start you know, actually um, trading in, in leads effectively using our platform to gather information and then making that available to partners. Would that be a, a worthwhile uh, compromise to make? And I, I actually, my impression was that, that there wasn't generally support for doing that and that, that actually, um, that might actually have a blowback on the, on the MOOCs rather than, and it would actually inevitably or ultimately lead to the OARU looking better for having stuck, stuck to its privacy principles all along. Um, so if we can market or get, make people aware of the fact that we have those principles and we maintain them, that in turn would um, make us preferable to the existing commercial MOOCs. Uh, so if you, is there any more down below there? Wayne is at the bottom. Okay. And uh, yeah, the, the, we had the idea perhaps that um, I, I, I made the point that a lot of times, uh, well, inevitably, existing institutions don't um, recognize the thing that's going to disrupt them by definition. <laughs> um, that's, that's why it's disruptive. Um, and one of the th possibilities that we were um, entertaining was that maybe the OERU is a disruptive force to the current structures of education and that perhaps you could interpret or, or, or justify OERU membership as effectively insurance against being completely upset by the, by the um, transition from one on one world order of education into a new one. 
And uh, so that, that actually potentially has a, um, well, I think that's quite a powerful um, justification for it. But anyway, uh, that's it. Does anyone have any questions? About that. Does anyone want to add anything that was in? Oh, sorry. Just a, a quick mention. I guess it was it was what I was thinking about with the previous session as well. One potential ROI for individuals teaching on these kinds of platforms is global recognition, because I think part of what's happened with the MOOCs has been it, the way to show off used to be by publishing a textbook or by getting published in highly cited journals or prestigious journals. Uh, the ability to get a global audience for teaching gives an opportunity for academics to show off, which is you know part of the value structure of higher education. Good point. So yeah, we have to work out how to create that opportunity. Thanks, thanks, Dave. Can I just add a, a couple of other things that we discussed in the group as well, and some of it will overlap with what what Dave has said and, and Andy as well. Um, from my perspective, I think there were some really big issues that we need to think about in terms of return on investment. So first of all, it was very much, it's not just about money, uh, although money is really important in some uh, of these activities, but there are many different types of return on investment. So we're a very broad church. Uh, you know, the network is a very broad church and there are lots of different houses in it and we're all in it for very different reasons, which is actually one of the strengths that you've got on the network is that we can be part of that and we can get different things out of it. Um, so we, we talked about, you know, about the social good, about efficiency, that you can get cost reductions for both individuals and institutions. Rory talked about that quite a bit, about some of the major savings that they were able to make. Uh, but there's also the potential for new income streams and about change, changing teaching practice you know, in course delivery. So there are lots of different things you can get out of your activity and involvement in the ORU. Um, but there are still some issues that we need to address. And this is something I think we might want to pick up tomorrow, um, or you can help shape that, that discussion tomorrow. And for me, it's around about sustainability. How do we make this network sustainable? Um, there's a lot of goodwill, there's a lot of input into it from interested parties, uh, but that won't sustain us forever. So we need to think about the sustainability of this. That then means then we've also got to look at part of the strategic plan is about the clarity of the mission and the vision of OERU. Um, do we continue like that or does it change? Does it adapt? Does it evolve? I don't know, but we need to have a discussion about that as to what, what the future is. Um, we mentioned about MOOCs. Again, it's what makes OERU different to the MOOCs is can we define that much more clearly than we currently do? Can we just, you know, can we build on that niche and develop that further? Um, and then the final bit, um, which you may or may not have in the notes, I'm not sure, Dave, was about um, OERU is a bit lost in the online environment. You know, there's, there's no real visibility. And we, we know we've done that on purpose. You know, we've had a soft launch, but now we need to really test it to see whether this is viable um, and see what comes back and then adapt and change from that. So it's finding your way in that online environment. Um, I think that was most that I picked up as the sort of facilitator. Does anybody else in the group have anything more? Uh, okay. Here we go. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, Narita, can I call on you to report back for the group that the discussion that we had on the Learning in a Digital Age initiative. Thanks, Wayne. Well, our, um, our task was um, to look at delivering the leader community learning hub in which we'll see libraries offer between, I think we said two and eight support sessions for the four micro sessions that are in the uh, leader course. And I just thought I would make a comment because I'm the librarian in the room, um, you know, on, on where libraries can sit in this space. Um, and I think the very natural role that we play. Well, one is that traditionally we're the providers of resources um, for our uh, institutions. This is our natural and traditional place. And also by extension in the digital space, libraries have never been closed places. You know, our doors have always been open to members of the public. 
And as we've gone online in the traditional publishing environment, um, we have found ourselves because of paywalls having to shut people out. Uh, but wherever possible, um, you know, we've tried to facilitate access to people. And so it is in the digital space um, as well. Uh, and, you know, made very easy by um, open licensing uh, and platforms. Uh, Rajiv um, also pointed to the fact of the really valuable role that libraries can play now in actually pulling in um, open records into our institutional discovery platforms, which of course are not closed anyway to, to the public um, to access. The other thing is that uh, we provide good support for projects and we're natural collaborators um, cross-departmentally. We already have an enterprise-wide role um, to support teaching, learning and research. So perhaps we don't have some of the um, siloing problems that um, academic departments might have. And also in this um, context, the library serves a valuable advocacy function uh, within the course and offering the course in OER. And perhaps this particular course might um, offer itself as a good case study in how um, libraries can deliver into uh, these courses. So um, all that we've, we've done here is actually um, plot a timeline and a method for delivering the library's component um, of the leader course. And I think we felt that although there's some finessing to be done here uh, in the working party, which will be formed to deliver this, um, we've got to just sequence these things properly, but we think we've identified um, a good path to the actual delivery of the um, uh, facilitated sessions. Any questions? No? Thanks very much. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, libraries are the first manifestation of open resources um, about providing public access to closed resources, um, the function of libraries. So what we will do is we'll put out an open invitation to any institution that wants to engage through the university libraries in this pilot uh, next year. Um, we've got a rough plan, so we're going to move forward, I reckon. Hmm. Any questions related to this? Nope. Um, so the, the next group on the list is the Open Pedagogy and the Open Boundary course folk. So let me get your document open there. Sure, thanks, Wayne. Um, and I'm going to ask that uh, everyone who was in our discussion just ch chime in when I'm missing something or if I misstate something. But we covered a lot of ground, and initially they were separate, and then we sort of brought the two streams together. Um, when we were talking about open boundary courses, we were initially talking about it in the context that was earlier described. I mean, imagining sort of OERU students and your traditional students who are tuition paying at your university interacting for a course. Um, it, it became evident that we would have to you know, pick courses uh, for this kind of a pilot that would uh, serve, that are already being deployed locally or that would serve local curricular needs. Um, likely have to work with instructors uh, who are also open to this kind of innovation. So being very sort of uh, strategic about which courses and which instructors we're working with, especially with a pilot like this. Um, there was a lot of discussion about having to be mindful of local jurisdictional issues, um, having to uh, certainly, whether you're talking about online harassment, IT policy side of things, especially if you're talking about a sandbox, a virtual space where uh, your students are interacting with non, uh, you know, let's say KPU students in this particular case, and how to balance that uh, in a, an environment that may or may not be moderated as well. So lots of discussions about that, about the cognitive load that would be required for students uh, to, to uh, develop and then utilize some of these new uh, digital literacies, for example. Um, we then, I think, moved beyond that, uh, especially when it occurred that we could do things more simply, like picking one specific activity within uh, an OERU course as an open boundary activity, as opposed to a whole, whole open boundary course. And then perhaps even easier than that, maybe we start by not even doing it with an OERU course. We pick a course that's currently offered by two or more member institutions across the partner network and uh, implement an activity that's an open boundary activity where the students at two or more institutions are interacting. Um, 
through a peer activity that may or may not involve an element of open pedagogy, but as a way of allowing us to learn about how to permeate those boundaries that teaches us the lessons that we need to know before we ramp it out uh, uh, to, to a wider uh, set of students who are not connected directly with any one of our institutions. Um, with open pedagogy, we were thinking about different ideas, things like students annotating micro course content within OERU courses, whether to contextualize, to augment, to explain, annotating even by providing brief uh, video explainers uh, to, or, or that help contextualize particular resources. We were thinking about whether curriculum developers, course developers across the OERU network, while they're developing the courses, could deliberately flag, highlight areas in the course content that they know will have to be revisited at some point because it's perhaps related to statistics or information that is dated or that's very culturally specific um, that would have to be revisited. Uh, and using those kinds of content flags from developers uh, to look at the potential of embedding open pedagogy activities where student ac assignments involve that updating, involve that contextualization as needed. Uh, we also talked about the potential role of students whether it's um, uh, 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 tuition-paying students in the context of an open boundary course or whether it's OERU students who are going through the course without uh, formal instructor facilitation, uh, really sharing some of their lessons learned and providing and building a guide for future students who would move through any of these courses to enrich the sort of ancillary learning resources that are available to uh, students who might use the course in the future, but also as a feedback loop for the curriculum developers as they might want to revisit uh, the design of that course as they identify spots where students need more support. Um, so in the end, <clears throat> we were talking about, uh, I should say, we also talked about uh, the importance of um, scaffolding the development of some of these critical digital and information literacies. There's lots of guides that already exist for this, this sort of work. Here's one. Uh, the Rebus community published a guide to making open textbooks with students. It has very useful things, including sample MOUs for when faculty are co-creating OER with students, navigating the process of explaining CC licensing to students. Um, Hypothesis, the tool that we, that we use for annotation that David talked about yesterday, also has a, a lovely step-by-step -step onboarding guides for students. We could adapt a lot of that content to provide the sort of support that students would need uh, to, to, to play with open pedagogy within OERU courses. But in the end, if we scroll all the way to the bottom, <laughs> um, all the way to the bottom. Oh, right, okay. Yes, yeah, so that's it. So uh, talking about identifying candidate courses that are already offered by partner institutions where we might be able to implement open boundary activities as a way of bridging to open boundary activities with OERU students and eventually open boundary courses. So starting in a very easy, accessible space um, recommendations for curriculum developers, as I said, to flag content areas that would require updating, but then potentially uh, leveraging open pedagogy as a way of addressing that moving forward. Also, in terms of curriculum developers, considering opportunities, again, uh, not always appropriate, not always uh, the right way to go, uh, but whether it's annotating, updating, contextualizing content, or any of the other elements we talked about, uh, opportunities to embed those open pedagogy activities. And given that that's already happening in at least one of the OERU microcourses right now, I think it'd be great to have a bit of a discussion for other people who want to do this as you're forecasting future course development and want to maybe infuse some of these elements. Uh, we can have that as a, as a nice forum discussion and support each other. Uh, and then finally, uh, developing or in, uh, mostly actually adapting uh, existing training resources for um, deploying open pedagogy with OERU students and with OERU uh, uh, developers and faculty uh, pointing to some of those over there. So I'm looking around to the room to see if there are other bits and pieces that you might want to highlight, people in the room. Lots of shakes of the head. All right? Okay. There's some links in there, uh, and I think this is a, a new emerging area. It's, it's not the case that we're trying to do something innovative in the OERU that is comfortable and safe and known within the traditional space. This is just as new and unfamiliar in the traditional space. So I think that's why we're talking about doing this in a very safe a uh, staged uh, or phased pr uh, process. I, I always, um, you know, when advising technology and learning PhD students, try and get them to think about what does this problem look like in a non-technology sense? And I can't help thinking that 
um, people have been wandering off the street and sitting in lecture theatres to sample lectures at universities for years. So in a way, it's not entirely new, the notion of allowing, you know, students who aren't enrolled in a course to kind of somehow participate. So, you know, just that, so just a slight counterpoint to saying that it's entirely new. It's, um, you know, exists in the face-to-face -face world. Absolutely. Yeah, and thanks for bringing that up. I think uh, even more sort of as courseware gets put online, the sort of reception of it, I, I think, is, is not new. And I think the concern that was being raised is, imagine the student who wanders in off the street to sample a lecture, suddenly speaking up and sharing rather misogynistic opinions in the classroom, how that might be navigated in the space, in the context of an online learning environment that we would have to be responsible for in terms of our students. So I, I agree. And I think we maybe have to think about the benefits of that and draw on that. Um, but yeah, so thank you. And the final group, um, having a chat about the SDGs and its relationship to, ah, Chris, you're gonna give feedback, fantastic. Cheers. Hi everyone. So there were a number of uh, questions that we were required to answer or asked to answer in relation to OERU micro courses that support the sustainable development goals. And so uh, in terms of creating sustainable futures, um, and most of this work was done by our colleagues, particularly Rachel um, from uh, University of Tasmania, are these four uh, units here. I'm not going to read every single one out to you, um, but those were from Otago. So I thought that was uh, really useful. They also identified an additional uh, seven units from other partner institutions. And you can tell from the titles, which are quite innovative, that there is a direct relationship to the SDGs uh, generally. Um, and I think one of the things that I have to say as being a, a participant in the group, I, I wanna um, uh, really um, just say how impressed I was with the work that the University of Tasmania has done uh, under Rachel's leadership around mapping uh, this and actually finding out that there's upwards of 10 units already, 10 courses already that are already well mapped with the SDGs because it pre presents itself with an, um, probably an unthought of opportunity to actually have um, a kind of a degree around the SDGs that OER can use going forward. And then if you keep going down, the second question we had was what additional micro courses uh, could the OER use uh, uh, in support of the SDGs in the next year or two? And there was a number that UTAS is working on because they've got uh, basically, and correct me if I'm wrong, 50 uh, separate courses that are pretty transdisciplinary in nature that could be stacked uh, to equal one um, course. The, the, uh, and I think that's really interesting. They're putting micro-credentials on. You've got eight altogether, is that correct? Okay, so one at the moment and creating another five or six. And so that was, I think, really exciting. Uh, the next question we had were what micro-credentials and exit qualifications could the, OR, uh, could the OREU be able to offer in support of the SDGs? And we thought uh, a first year of study in sustainability that's really explicitly mapped to the SDGs. And you could think about how that would be appealing uh, to different uh, people across all uh, parameters of the world, really, uh, because the SDGs are so um, uh, quite important. We've got some additional areas to support the SDGs, and this is where I think our discussion was really, really exciting. One of the things we thought uh, was that, you know, the UN could play a direct role uh, with um, sort of acknowledging that these micro-credentials exist, and they could recommend them, and they could approve them, and that would really uh, increase the take-up of, particip of possible participants, participants, particularly if they were going to lead to some kind of a, a qualification or a UN-recognized uh, uh, degree, and we thought that was really, really uh, interesting. Also, in Australia, with the new Colombo funding, uh, where universities get millions of dollars to send students overseas, we could have some um, of these that were actually a prerequisite for actually undertaking your work uh, when you go overseas, particularly around gender. Uh, you know, depending on what it is, but you know, there were there was a few key ones. Um, intercultural communication, for example, uh, would be a really uh, important. Um, we also thought um, uh, it would be a really good idea for uh, the OERU uh, to work with, particularly in Australia, for, and there's probably groups like this in other countries, the Foundation for Young Australians. FYA has a number of really pivotal reports uh, about um, young Australians and the fact that many young Australians cannot find work because in schools they haven't been 
uh, learning the skills they need that employers want, where uh, that these micro-credentials could be offered to your year 10, year 11, and year 12 high school students to help them not only get into university, but acquire particular kinds of skills uh, that employers want um, and, and right now the FYA's uh, got a, an amazing web presence and their uh, reports that they've published since 2015 from the new work order to uh, now it's called the new work smarts. Um, and, and they've actually talked about recognizing micro credentials. We found out when we looked at their site today, I think Wayne found that out. So it's really timely um, to perhaps maybe even think about a partnership with them where they could actually approve some of these micro credentials much in the same way the UN might and then encourage young people to take them up or education systems to recognize them as valid um, and also perhaps even tie them to the Australian curriculum. There's aspects of the Australian curriculum, particularly the Australian curriculum technologies, which many uh, people are struggling uh, current teachers to teach because they don't have a background in technologies. and. Um, the last thing we talked about was the State of the uh, Future Report, which is done by the Millennium Project. It comes out every two years. The 2015 to 2017 one is out, uh, and it's open access now, and it highlights the 15 global challenges facing uh, all of us on planet Earth. And one of the things that they talk about in that report is technologies um, and, uh, and equitable and sustainable use of technologies, and also the danger of cyber technologies and cyber terrorism, et cetera, and how this actually would be something that we could um, also pretty, pretty much talk about these units or these courses in relation to achieving or addressing some of these challenges that humanity faces and how the OERU has a suite of micro-credentials uh, that are really useful um, in, in working to uh, you know, address these challenges. And clearly what are the next steps are to action the ones that I just talked about. So. <laughs> So you're all welcome to do that <laughs> with us in partnership. <laughs> so thank you. Any questions? Uh, and my group is uh, free to answer them too if you have about the SDGs and some of the stuff we discussed. Yeah. I'll give you the mic so everyone, in case they're online, can hear you. Wouldn't our work focus on SDG for the education for all? And how does it rate to the others? I don't really see how much it relates to the other. Um, the question was around how it relates to SDG4 when we actually discussed this because I asked the same exact question because SDG4 is really about getting um, ac you know, young people access to primary education and we thought that overarching it, it would all really um, it would meet SDG4 but the, there's 50 titles of, of, of units for example that have been mapped the breadth units from the U University of Tasmania and there are very transdisciplinary, and they could be used by teachers as well um, as uh, by students and those interested um, in working towards the SDGs, but we felt that they would hit uh, SDG 4 clearly as well as the other ones. The way they've mapped them out, and um, I don't have the piece of paper, but please, uh, Rachel can share the paper. She's mapped them out in a really interesting way. She's got uh, the SDGs along the top and then the course titles down along the left side and how different courses hit different SDGs and the way they've already been designed in terms of their descriptions and their learning outcomes and I would imagine their assessment tasks. Are there any other questions?